Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. Before we get started with the episode, I want to tell you about a new ebook available on our website called Buyer Beware. Why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? This ebook covers the various types of annuities, negatives to owning annuities, and better investment alternatives to annuities. To download this ebook, you can click the link in the episode notes or go to wiserinvestor.com and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to a Wise Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith. Today, we, I'm joined by guest uh, Robert Swarthout. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Robert's the uh, president, founder, Teton Capital, Crypto yes. Capital. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> uh, and good friend of Wiser. We yes. had that. Yep. Um, so today, we're going to talk about why we think crypto is so difficult for the common investor to understand. Yes. You know, crypto ends up in the news cycle and, you know, I think, you know, generally the news likes to pick up negative things um, and, you know, tries to explain them. But at the end of the day, you have a new technology that, you know, is roughly 14 years old. And if you kind of like think back when the Internet was 14 years old, you know, that was late 90s, really. Right. Um, And how was it, you know, how was it perceived then? Well, it was perceived as niche, confusing, you know, something people did in their dark basement, those kind of things. Um, You know, even the media, when they were talking about it, they couldn't quite explain it and they would be confused. There's that famous um, uh, article, I mean, article video where um, Katie Couric was trying to explain what an email address was and they were trying to explain the at sign, right? Like we all understand (laughs) what at signs are these days. Back then it was that funny thing on a keyboard that no one really used. Right. Um, Right. So, you know, you just end up with, you know, people learning on the job, which I think is there's, that's positive, but you know, when people read things in the news too often, I think they believe them as true versus trying to like dig deeper and understand what the problems are, you know, the issues with what is being said. Um, If you've ever known a lot about something and then that something pops up in the news and you read the article and you go, no, this is, this is all incorrect. (laughs) Yes. It's like any aviation related article I've ever read, not in an aviation publication, but just like Wall Street Journal, whatever you read it and you're like, this this is not accurate. I think probably most recent is um, the SpaceX mm. rocket blow up and right. the headlines: Fox, CNN, Wall Street Journal. Everybody says uh, bad day for Elon. Mm. Actually, it was a great, great success. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it didn't blow and up the, in the pad. It's, it's yeah. a super rocket. I, right. I, what's the official name for it? Do you remember um, the I, Falcon I, Heavy? No, Fal- is, is it Falcon Heavy? I forget. I thought Falcon Heavy had three rockets. Oh, anyway. no, Falcon Heavy already is happening. It's clearly it's we're really doing exactly what the media is yes. doing. But but the the point is is that when you launch rockets, you blow up a lot of rockets, mm. and because all this data is coming back down to the computer, and they're learning so much about how to make it better. And you knew from that the whole the whole point was to get it past the pad. Mm-hmm. Anything past the pad on that rocket launch was mm-hmm. extra, right? I, you know, <laughs> as an aside, there I I remember well I, I didn't see it live but i remember watching the video and you could see the a picture or video of the bottom of the that rocket and how many of the engines were not working and yes it was still flying i was <laughs> like right. this is so cool <laughs> and the one that was sputtering as yes. it was going up but if you listen to the live feed of the rocket launch they even told you mm. that what the purpose was and anything it, i think uh the 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 lady who does the commentary i think she, she said anything past the pad is icing on the cake mm-hmm. and and so clearly anybody who wrote about the rocket launch was not actually listening <laughs> to the rocket launch yeah I, <laughs> you know obviously it's still to come but i you know when they decide they actually come back and land the starship oh yeah um and this how it lands i remember where i was at when they first um successfully landed just a normal booster um, that came back to, I think on the drone ship yeah. off, off of, uh, the coast of Florida. And it just like, I, I remember that moment. I imagine the next moment will be the, um, uh, when the starship comes flopping down sideways and <laughs> or just, it crashes. Yeah. Yeah. Those, the, the start, yeah, that's an expensive crash. Um, yeah. but it's all part of the, 
all process. part of the all part of the process. And yeah. it's no different than um, there's another company that's doing 3D printing to make rockets, which actually could put some pressure on SpaceX and their cost per launch. But mm. um, you know they they've had mildly successful launches, but no one's given them crap about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. so anyway, the, the, we digress. Yeah. <laughs> the The point is, is that, um, you know, crypto and the news, you have to be really careful. I mean, I read stuff in the Wall Street Journal and I forward it to you and you've, mm-hmm. you always respond to me. He's like, yeah, that's not how that works. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, admittedly, the Wall Street Journal of the major publications is at least the crypto writers yeah. are probably a little bit ahead of the, um, the learning curve than most of the media, you know, and, and there's pockets that are, that are really, um, that get it or particular like, um, reporters. So there's, um, a reporter on CNN, uh, her name is Julia. I forget her last name, but she seems to cover crypto and do well. And there's a, a reporter on CNBC international that does a good amount of, um, interviewing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's, there's pockets of them or small number of them, but they have a, um, you know, they have a big challenge in front of them because it, you know, the technology is admittedly confusing and it's moving quickly and evolving. Yeah. So, you know, I think, um, I think the reason why individual investors struggle the most is you can't touch it or feel it. It doesn't, it doesn't pay income. Um, currently they don't, they don't use it mm-hmm. every day. It, you know, it's like yeah. they, they, they can adapt to new things if, okay, this is how I'm going to pump gas now. <laughs> I'm no longer going to pull the handle down. I'm, I'm going to put my credit put card, card in. in. You, know, you remember for a long time, people wouldn't put their credit. Oh, I'm not paying at the pump. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. They walk in, you know, um, but it, it, it's, they don't understand what the real purpose of it is. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an evolving answer here because it's, you know, you're, you're right for the average U S person, investor, whatever you want to call them. Crypto is not really going to change their life in, in, in the short term. Right. Um, you know, maybe if you are in the finance department at a business and you're paying bills internationally, it's going to change part of your working life more on the on the shorter end of the time frame than it will be on your you know, on the personal side. You know, I, I think that where, where we start seeing crypto creep into our personal lives is, you know, it, in an NFT that becomes a ticket for, say, a concert or, you know, your identity ends up in a digital form and likely could end up in a blockchain. Right. So you know, outside of straight disinvesting on the speculative side of the price going up or down, you know, I don't think it's going to materially change much for, you know, a U.S. person short term. But, it, you know, it's like I've said in other podcasts, it's the plumbing of the financial system that's changing. And once that's changed, maybe things happen quicker. You know, like this summer, I think it's June or July, the Fed is launching Fed now. It's 24-7, 365 settlement of payments in the U.S., between banks right now we're on a five day a week minus holidays at from I think nine to four or something nine yeah. to five. I forget exactly when wires can set or settle during the day. So you pay your Amex bill on a Saturday morning. It'll actually get paid on a Saturday yeah. morning. So some people that are um, <laughs> floating the, the weekend again, or say it might be floating the weekend <laughs> might be um, not so much floating anymore. Um, but it's a, you know, the, the world's coming in, but that's again, just domestic, but most people only live in a domestic world for, for all intents and purposes. Right. So, but yeah. So I think in another angle to look at why this is so confusing to um, investors is, you know, what they may be seeing in the media when it, when the media is covering other things. So in this case, I'm referring to the regulators. So the SEC and the CFTC are for all intents and purposes fighting over crypto right now. Like, is it a commodity? Is it a security? They, you know, they each have their viewpoints. I think that some crypto or a lot, a large portion of the small and medium cap coins, they're, they act like securities all day long. Like, but should they be under the same regime that a traditional security, like an equity is under? I think that may be difficult for the technology considering how um, distributed around the world this stuff is. Um, so you end up with some people having to play by different rules than others because just because they live in a different country, but they're working with the same asset mm-hmm. is tricky. Um, you know, so the CFTC is governed by the, um, the committee in Congress that deals with agriculture kind of 
weird, but it really goes back to the days of corn and all that kind of stuff happening. Um, that were the futures of those products. The SEC is governed by the House Financial Services Committee. And, you know, you would think that the SEC doesn't have to answer to them. They've been acting like they don't since Gary Gensler has been in office and in the way that they've been running it. But there was recently a committee meeting where Gensler was, had to sit there and he hadn't been um, in front of that committee since I think October of 21. So it'd been a while. And he, they were asking him yes or no questions, like literally saying, I, I'm asking for a yes or no answer here. And he would give him this, this like multi-sentence thing that was like a non-answer, you know, like is Ethereum a security? Well, if you go back to the previous administration's SEC chairman and um, his, you know, I guess other people that work for him, they would say Ethereum was not a security. Like there's this famous speech. Now the SEC is not even willing to claim whether it's a security or not a security. Like it's like so confusing to market participants. Um, You know, Coinbase has even said that they're willing to move outside the U.S. if this thing can't get cleared up. So it's... You know, what does that mean for U.S. investors? I have no idea um, right. for, if you're a Coinbase customer, but it's just, it's, it's a state of affairs that like is embarrassing, quite honestly. Like, you know, Europe's getting their act together. They have a MICA, M-I-C-A um, set of regulations that are coming into place that are pretty well-rounded. And you have the U.S. out here kind of going the opposite direction, trying to figure out how to like regulate it away versus um, trying to guard guardrails and rules around it to protect investors. So. I, and that's another reason uh, I think individual investors have struggled with this is, is the lack of, lack of regulation. And I think if, you know, and it goes twofold is once regulations in place, once we, all this has been defined and once the government is okay, or the, you know, the, the creators, uh, I, I guess the legacy firms get caught up with the, the creators of all this, um, you're, you're probably too late. It's, it's a mature asset class at that point, uh, unless it just really takes off for multiple multiple purposes. But right now, for like, you know, at our firm, people people are here to maintain their standard of living. Mm-hmm. We're we're not investing in things that are. Um, you could lose all your money in. Right. No, you're <laughs> right. not a casino. You know? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Um, it, as, as Brad often says uh, internally, our, our, our first, our first uh, mandate is to do no harm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a great way to think about it. You know, so, it's, so you translate that into, so we, you know, we have mainstream invest, investors, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, several or many uh, ultra high net worth, uh, high net worth clients. And then we have just regular old clients. Um, that, that you do find any other firm mm-hmm. and for them, a lot of them do have crypto on their own on the side. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them have talked about it with much passion. And then we had the bubble burst, the uh, crypto winter or mm-hmm. whatever we are going to call that. Yeah. Um, you know, they just kind of like, uh, they didn't sell it. They still have it as far as I know, but right. But they're they've just stopped like, talking about it. Stop talking about yeah. it. Yeah. The, the barbershop doesn't talk about it anymore either, which is yeah. usually a good sign. Yes. So the point is, is that why, why does an individual investor add that to their portfolio at this point? Well, it's the psychology of investing, right? When nobody wants to touch this stuff, it might be the time you might want to buy it. <laughs> why, why? And when everybody's talking about it, it's probably the time you want to sell it. Yeah, um, true. It, it, it certainly holds true in Buffett, crypto. Warren Buffett quote there. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah I'm paraphrased poorly, but it's, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's, it holds true so, so strongly in crypto because the hype cycles are just so extreme. Like, you know, even if you like compare it to the equities, like when things are going really well, like people aren't like probably checking their 401k every day or multiple times a day. <laughs> right. Right. In crypto, they have it on app on their phone and they're like <laughs> opening it up and like refresh, refresh. I, yeah. I guess maybe the, the closest thing would be when the Robin hood stuff was going crazy during the, the, the meme, negative, the negative learning. Stocks. Yes, absolutely. Some negative. I've stuff. seen a few people open up their, their crypto apps and, I mean, clients here and, and they also, there's a correlation. They also love gambling. Like they love going mm-hmm. to casinos. And so it gives them that kind of that same that feeling. Yeah, I mean, cause you can do, you can trade crypto 24 seven, right? So like functionally, and, and there's enough price movement. Yes. In some know? of these, absolutely. You can stocks don't uh, have that kind of price movement. I, 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 I do not advocate anybody doing um, active <laughs> um, crypto trading because, because the markets are, 
a because there's no regulation, but like yeah. are so manipulated. Like, you know, we won't have to get into it here, but it's just it's sad because you can. I see it all the time on Twitter where somebody's like, I was trading and I had, you know, a stop loss in place and, you know, it went down and went down, you know, to that number or a penny lower than went right back up. Yeah. It's like, because, because the, it's not regulated and they can kind of stop loss hunt and they can take out. Right. So. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And I would, are there not hedge funds that do that? I mean, cause um, it's, it's, there's probably some, uh, you know, some that do that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily know personally, but it's hedge funds and, or just like, straight you know just sophisticated traders that have the data from exchanges or you know you can read stories about maybe not u.s based exchanges but exchanges outside the u.s where admittedly a lot of u.s investors go to do trading because all, not all the tokens are, are available here are, yeah. yeah and you know are the exchanges on the up and up they could be sending a separate data feed to their vip clients that yeah. gives them that kind of access i mean they're the that's not something that couldn't happen. And so. we used to say, you know, Coinbase and, and you know, U.S. based uh, type storage or we call them brokers in my world. Mm -hmm. But, that, you know, that's where you want to keep your assets. But even that, I think it's somewhat questionable at this point. I, I think you'd if you have a sizable amount of money, you'd want to create your own wallet, which yes. now you're getting into um, a whole different level of, of how, how to use your computer. You know? Well, that and, you know, how you doing backups. I mean, there's a lot of questions that have to start being asked there. Yeah. Um, you know, are, is your token safe at a Coinbase? Likely. I mean, they, they have it literally a, a custody division. And yeah. they, they do that for institutions. So I feel like they probably have that figured out. Um, but again, they, the, old, the old adage in crypto is, you know, not your keys, not your crypto. So right. that doesn't change just because Coinbase seems to be on the up and up. So obviously if regulation changes then there's a clear path forward. Anything beyond that do you think helps individual investors? I, you know, I think, I think just a, a narrative change within, you know, we can have regulations and we could have a negative um, agenda slash narrative from an administration like we do now. Yeah. Or we could have positive. I think a positive or just outright neutral. Yeah. <laughs> like an, I would take neutral at this point. Right. Um, you know, stance on crypto would be something that would, I don't know, within a year would double the market cap of the whole, all of crypto. Like, I think the U.S. is so negative and our capital markets are so large that we have so much more say than I think people realize. Do you think that they're negative because the U.S. is concerned about a currency overtaking their us dollar that they yeah. control so tightly i think that there's a lot of incumbents that are like dug in deep and they're pushing hard um i think it's very because, political right because, now because they don't understand it either or because mm. they see they see a th they see it as a threat i could see like, i actually think there could be multiple things at play here i i think what's the larger thing at play here is not necessarily the us dollar and its reserve status i think that's the feds you know not having a good budget in the U.S. and all this other stuff is what's ruining the reserve status. When you weaponize your currency and you use it as a weapon too many times, guess what? Countries are going to leave you. Right. I, I think the U.S. has done that to itself. But I think what's more crypto-specific here is you have the incumbent banks like the J.P. Morgans, the, the, the Goldmans that have, they make a lot of money off of fees in the cities that, you know, say do wire transfers in our correspondent banking. Right. They, they have motivation to see the system stay the way it is. And I think that they may be using their leverage behind the scenes in a political way to get the administration to kind of kind of come back around and, you know, hey, Gary, be negative on crypto or, you know, just kind of like stir the pot effectively. And I think that the administration probably in all likelihood is not educated enough on crypto to know whether they're being fed facts or just a yeah. bunch of crap. Right. And, you know, here we get to pay the price for that. So, Interesting. well, it's, cer it's certainly going to be, um, it, it's, it's going to be interesting what happens in the next, I was about to say five years, probably even two years. Yes. Government moves slow, um, but they seem to be moving a little faster uh, than, than normal just yeah. because the, the market is probably demanding that at this point. Yeah. There's, 
There's a lot of grumpy people within the crypto space with regards to regulators and Congress because regulations come from Congress. The yeah. SEC can't make regulations. The SEC right. enforces them or the CFTC or whatever. You know, I, at the beginning of the year, I thought we were going to see the basic form of crypto regulation, maybe stable coin stuff. I don't think there's a chance that we see that at all this year. Um, I've, I've read that, you know, in all likelihood, we don't see meaningful regulation out of Congress until we get a new administration, potentially a new administration to 2025. Jeez. Yeah. To two years away. I think what we, the only sort of quote unquote clarity that we get right now comes from courts and that's just slow and painful. Yeah. Um, you have the um, Ripple and SEC case that is for all intents and purposes ready to be decided. Just waiting on the judge to make a judgment there. That could be, you know, five minutes from now or a month from now. So we're certainly at the end of the tail end of that. That's two, almost two and a half years in the making there. Uh, you have the case where the Grayscale, the company that has those, yeah. uh, those publicly traded trust, um, was suing the SEC because they wouldn't approve a spot Bitcoin. Right. And that actually is on an accelerated path because... I think because it came from the SEC, because they're suing the SEC or something around that. There's uh, where they got to kind of start at a higher level of court. I don't, yeah. I don't fully understand it, admittedly. And it sounds like they're going to win that um, against the SEC. Like, hmm. th- like the SEC, the judge was pulling no punches. And I think it's it's obvious that judges are watching other cases that right. other judges are dealing. And there, I, there's there's this groundswell of judges that are just kind of like tired of the SEC's antics. Which, you know, in, in this case is good because I agree with what the judges are doing. Other times you may not agree with it. Right. Um, right. And then just um, just last night, Coinbase sued the SEC. So not SEC suing Coinbase. The Coinbase sued the SEC for not responding to their request for rulemaking from last June or July. So almost, you know, call it nine months ago. Yeah. And the SEC, excuse me, the um, Coinbase is literally in their lawsuit asking for a yes or no answer to what, what they had submitted. And apparently when you ask a um, agency for rulemaking, they have a set period of time they have to respond in and Coinbase is, excuse me, the SEC is outside of that at this point. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, Coinbase a year ago was very much like, oh, we'll do whatever the SEC wants kind of type mentality in my opinion. Um, they didn't, they weren't really supportive at all of Ripple or X, XRP in that case with the SEC until the very end when they could do amicus briefs and they saw how much of an overreach the SEC was doing. Mm-hmm. Now they are very much on the offensive, which I think is the correct um, tack right now for crypto in general. You have to be willing to almost throw the first punch um, with, a, with a regulator that is acting so far outside of what is reasonable. So. so that goes back to, all right, individual investor, I see this crypto, and then I consider putting it into my portfolio but I see all this regulation and this back and forth. Um, that that's a that's a roadblock. There's another roadblock. In that, how many cryptos are there? <laughs> Twenty something thousand. Yeah. Twenty something thousand. You got Dogecoin and things that you hear about in the news. And so, if you know nothing about this, you buy that co- coin thinking there's like a purpose behind it and that it's like mm-hmm. legitimate. But as an individual investor, it's it's kind of like going to uh, buy stocks, and you, but you don't really know the companies, but you just kind of hear something and go, "Oh, maybe I'll try this one." Um, there's actually there's there's actually a, like a market cap order, yes, uh, to this. But market cap is the only ranking that we have in crypto right now, but it's a terrible <laughs> right. one, <laughs> right? Because well, you end up with something like Doge and Shiba being on yeah, the list. that's true, that's true. Because of a bunch of other idiots, it's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, maybe there needs to be a. Um, so there's an ETF.com where you mm-hmm. go to ETF, you do forward slash, you type in the ticker, mm-hmm. and it has all this data about what's behind it. It should be yeah. a crypto.com done the same way. And I, you put in the... I think over time there will be. <laughs> we need regulations to understand what kind of the metrics that need to be in place. Yes. And how reporting happens and like all this kind of stuff. Right now it doesn't happen. But there's cryptos that can be segregated by their purpose. Right. You t- yes. I think that, you know, fast forward some number of years, you start having different types of cryptos, right? Different types of tokens. So like you have like a utility token, you have a one that's a true security and you right. have some other hybrid. I think there's probably two or three buckets that we end up with probably named differently. Yeah. And or like a currency based one or right. That, I mean, that could be the know. utility one potentially. Okay. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it's just, 
you know, you were saying how all, all these, I wouldn't say fear, but all these questions around it, like for the average investor, right? Like how do they know which one to pick? Well, I'm a believer that 99% of those 20,000 are going to zero. Yeah. Okay. Not, I don't say that to put fear into anybody. Just like understand the game that you're playing. Right. And at the end of the day, I think it takes just a lot of research unless you're going to be speculative and you're going to be, you know, almost I say day trading, but swing trading it. That's different. Yeah. But if you're trying to be in this long term, it takes a lot of research. And part of what you're getting paid for by taking on all that risk is the potential upside. Right. Yeah. If you get it right, you're going to get it right. Yeah. In a, in a good size way. And but can you get it right with the top two coins? So right Bitcoin now. and Ethereum, you know, what does right mean to you in that sense? Well, get it right means that'd be outside. You'd have to have an outsized return. So you know, I think is that Bitcoin going to go to a million. Is it? I, I'm not in that camp. At least in, not in, even even in five years. I have trouble seeing that. Yeah. Um, I mean, if Bitcoin goes to a million dollars in the next five years or shorter, that means that we have, I think, other things happening in the world that I don't think we really want to happen. Collapse, uh, of, collapse uh, or economies, or financial systems, those kind of things. Yeah. I think that'd be potentially a flight to safety there. Um, but I don't know that, that that's more of a guess. The flight to safety right now is still short term U S treasuries. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, yeah. you look at what just happened in 22 yeah. flight safety was not to Bitcoin. The flight Correct. to safety was the two month, three but month that treasury, but that wasn't a currency melting down. That no, was it was this, not yeah. a currency melting down. Yeah. No. No. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I have, I have a podcast in the works um, for our listeners about just about that. Um, there's been so much talk about this now BRICS because South Africa is included, included in that, but so much talk about um, that currencies and what's happening down there. And you think about uh, how that relates to crypto is that's where crypto like, Yes. Makes the most sense. The, um, <laughs> it's in the side of those countries, which many of those, it's illegal to even have crypto, right? right? Because the they're government, trying to support up their the government their knows their that they can't even hand, handle their own currency, much yeah. less a foreign currency. I, you know, as an aside, the, I saw that the BRICS, um, you know, they're kind of doing their new thing together right now or setting it up. Yeah. That 17 other countries ask for, um, to be members of that new thing. Like, right. It's, it's a real thing. Yeah. It was because people get fed up with, the, um, the, the international monetary fund and the world and the world bank, because there's all these rules and regulations and it, it's kind of like going to a normal bank and you mm-hmm. get the rum around and then you end up doing a loan with some dude on the internet for 12%, right? <laughs> right. It's just faster, easier. Yeah. And, um, and, when, and when the fed raised rates last year, that made it really expensive to get dollars outside the U S yeah. and a lot of these countries are having to pay debt in it. And I get it that they are trying to look for alternatives. Right. So now I will remind everyone Again, we have a, we could have two whole podcasts about this, but everyone keeps talking about China and and the yuan, right? Mm-hmm. The yuan is still backed or pegged to the U.S. dollar. I didn't realize that. So if they they're doing all these things now, if they ever change that, then they'll turn the world upside down. They also turn China upside down currently, right? <laughs> but, yeah. but right now, the yuan is pegged to the U.S. dollar. So even if you trade in yuan. Or, or the ruble's not obviously, mm-hmm. but if you trade in one, it, it's still it's still in the end. What is China do with it? There's nothing right. they can do with it to, to bring stability to their own currency other than holding the U.S. dollar. So that that's the important piece switching. of this that people are not reporting in the news when they talk about all this. And usually, unfortunately, it's like right wing um, <laughs> newsletters and things of that nature. They're trying mm-hmm. to scare people into buying their subscription or uh, buying gold, okay, exactly. buy, <laughs> <laughs> buying silver yeah. or something like that. But you have to remember that the even if even in all that rhetoric um, and it's not exactly anti-American rhetoric, but it's, mm-hmm. there's a, the undertone to it. Right. Um, they're still buying our bonds because they have to. Yeah. I mean, if you start trading in one instead of dollars, you're just switching your counterparty. Like, yeah, correct. I mean, especially if they're pegged together. So it's interesting to think through that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, so back to your question about, um, you know, for the top two, so Bitcoin and Ethereum, like I, I, I believe they will appreciate over the next, you know, some number of years. The way that I look at, you know, when I do investments in the fund is like, where am I going to get a better return on the investment? You know, like, I, I, I tend to buy, you know, some high cap coins, but more mid cap coins because I feel like some of the risk is taken out of them 
because that, that have a purpose that have yeah well right. yes there's a, there's a long checklist <laughs> to make it into something that gets purchased but like generally that you know they, they make it through all this other screening but what kind of return like you know is it something that can double in value or something like that and it's you know i have to be careful because i'm not giving financial advice but it's the 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 challenge of trying to figure out you know the risk reward there um and i you know i don't see you know, a lot of these coins could, you know, go up two, three, four hundred percent. Yeah. Is that going to happen to Bitcoin? I don't know. In that same period of time, maybe. I, you know, I just think the more, the, the bigger the market cap already is, the harder that becomes. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah. Unless it gets adopted into something. I mean, for a short time, you could buy a Tesla Bitcoin. And that gave a little more legitimate legitimacy yeah, to it. It was a PR but, stunt. <laughs> but, yeah. but it was quickly retracted. So now, what do you do with Bitcoin now? Um, it's kind of becoming more of, I think a store value storage value because you know, it's expensive to transact. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're buying a car, the, the eight or $10 that it costs to do a Bitcoin transaction probably is, you know, inconsequential. Yeah. But if you're buying a cup of coffee, probably pretty consequential. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but you know, just you know, the example of buying stuff with Bitcoin or accepting it as payment for businesses. The problem is the sec requires um, businesses to hold it on their balance sheet and they mark to market it down, but they won't allow them to market market it up. Mm. So again, that's another anti, in my opinion, another anti crypto yeah. um, thing that they've done. It's just kind of like, why? Why do we? Why do we have to act like kids? Can we act like adults here, please? Right. So, right. but you know, incumbent banks, you know, yeah, have a lot of this uh, way. I mean, think about it. They what they just did with the banks? They did mark to market uh, down. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, up really, but they yeah. gave them the they gave them the par value, even though yeah. it it, it had dropped to, yes. to in fifty percent in value in order to keep the regional banks afloat. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that, that that polar opposite approach with uh, with Bitcoin. Yeah, it's uh, and we we could talk all day about <laughs> how it's just not fair. But you know, <laughs> as things become more fair, I think it becomes a more obvious trade, and then. Yeah, you know, maybe I would say the trade is gone at that point, but you know, some of the upside is certainly taken out of it. Right. Well, I, I see, I see it in portfolios long term. I think it's, um, I, I think it's hard unless you're a high net worth, ultra high net worth investor, which all your all your clients are. You, you don't have any. Um, you have to be accredited. Yeah, accredited, non accredited uh, investors, and then even then, you want to limit it to about well, one two percent of your of your total investment portfolio. So, but that's why we do this podcast. We do this podcast because you have to be learning more about this. You have to be learning what's coming around the corner. You can't sit here with your head in the sand right. and not understand the, what the future is going to be looking like. Um, and, you know, thank you for your insight. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, we had a great podcast uh, last episode. If you want to, if you have, if you missed that one, mm-hmm. uh, we had Don Friedman in. Uh, talking about the uses and futures of crypto and how advisors use cryptos. Uh, That was a great, uh, very popular episode. Take a listen to that if you missed that one. Otherwise, we'll see you next month, Robert. Yep, take care. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced and edited by Ken Hopley.